Hi, my name is Emily Tate and I'm from Mind the Product. And in this talk, I'm gonna mostly be talking to the engineering teams, but I will be speaking to product managers as well. I've spent most of my career as a product manager. And many years ago, I was working with a development team and things were not going well. We were far behind on a really important project. Our platform was a mess and we were fighting over really stupid things. One in particular was over the level of prioritization. We couldn't agree on how much information I should have about how things were getting built. At one point, my development counterpart said, think about it like you're going to a restaurant. You order a hamburger, you just care that you get the hamburger you ordered. You don't care whether I put the lettuce on first or the tomato, and you really don't care if I replaced the dishwasher last week. You just want a hamburger. And I realized in that we had a fundamental disconnect in our understanding of each other's roles. They viewed me as a customer, someone putting in an order and waiting for my hamburger. But I, as a product manager, viewed myself as a part of the team. This us versus them mentality comes from a history of a toxic cycle. Particularly in large enterprises, you have the business owner, a tech team, and a large wall in between, often in, for in the form of an ocean. The business comes up with requirements and hands them over to tech, who builds some stuff over months or years, and then hands it back, and we're all shocked when things don't turn out well. This product and development should be sitting on the same side of the table from each other. But in environments like these, not only are we not on the same side, we're not even at the same table. Building great product is a team sport and having a strong product and engineering collaboration can be a winning combination. We bring different skills to the table and complement each other in different ways. But in order to work well together, we have to understand each other. So today I want to tell you where I'm coming from as a product manager and tips for working with me that will help you get the most value out of your product manager that you work with. So where I'm coming from. As a product manager, we often describe our roles as the intersection between tech, business, and user experience. So it means that I'm sitting in a spot where I'm pulled in all sorts of different directions on a day-to-day -day basis. And the reality of my world is that there will never be a shortage of good ideas. The backlog will always be longer than what we can feasibly build. And there will never be a shortage of opinions. I have a, vari a variety of stakeholders, all with differing views on what's important. Leadership, marketing, sales, development, legal, security, my customers, someone on Twitter who's an expert because he saw a picture of my product once who has strong opinions about what I'm building. Everyone has differing views on what we should be building. So a major part of my job is distilling all of those inputs, figuring out where to go next, and providing focus for the team. I am constantly asking one question of myself. What is the most valuable thing that we can deliver next? I'm also very good at helping teams know when to stop. One of my developer friends once told me that what he really needed for his side project was not more developers. He knew how to build the tech. It was a product manager to tell him when he was done. This holds true with teams as well. Product managers are great at knowing when we have done enough and can move on to the next thing to start getting learning and start getting value delivered to our customers. So a few tips of how to get the most value out of me as a product manager. This goes for anyone working with us, whether it be developers, whether it be designers, um, or even other product managers within the organization. The first tip, shorten the feedback loop. Oftentimes teams get into a spot where we don't want to present things to each other until they're in a state of done. But again, product managers are really good at making decisions quickly. Janice Frazier, a consultant and advisor, great product leader, uh, once described product management as decision-making as a service. And she talked about it as making decisions in service of the team. There are so many things that we have to decide on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be a sort order or the way that something works for the end user or 
bigger conversations around what we're going to build next. And making all of those decisions can be very difficult. We put our names on those decisions and are happy to help make them on behalf of the team as needed or pull in the right people to make those decisions together. So to shorten the feedback loop, here's a, a small list of, of times when you might come talk to your product manager. I want you to talk to me when a story I've written is unclear. Uh, a story is clear, but it's taking a long time. A story is clear, but you found an edge case that can be handled multiple ways. Uh, an edge case can be handled multiple ways and the story asks for the most difficult way. You built something, but it feels weird. You built something, but it breaks something else. You built something and it works perfectly. Talk to me then. Uh, you want some cupcakes. It really doesn't matter. Seriously, cupcakes. The point here is that you should talk to me all the time about things that are big or things that are small. Building software should be a collaborative effort. Development teams shouldn't be pure order takers. Raising the flag is often enough to get a different decision or at least make something an intentional decision that doesn't cause you pain that could have otherwise been avoided. So you may be a little bit skeptical of some of these tips that I give you. So um, I've heard things like, my product manager is never available. I would like to give them get feedback quicker. I would like to talk to them more, but they're really busy. They're in meetings all the time. They're never available. Well, I wanna give you a little bit of insight into some of those meetings. You may see us in a room with sticky notes on the wall and people gathered around and discussing things, uh, but what's actually going on within those meetings or in the devices in front of you, we have all the collaboration tools sitting in front of us. We are available if needed. And if there are quick decisions or things that you need to, to know, um, or just need to say, hey, come talk to me when, you're, when you have a moment, we have the ability to get that. Don't let the feeling of being too busy keep you from talking to your product manager. And for my product managers, um, yeah, we're gonna need you to move your desk. Granted, this may be more difficult right now given the situation a lot of us are in, uh, but if you are in person, move your desk to be as close to your development team as possible. If you don't have a desk, just make sure you're engaging with your development team on a regular basis. It's far more important to engage regularly with your development team than it is to engage with your marketing team, which in a lot of companies is where we tend to spend most of our time. When I was working on a big redesign of my app, um, we were things were slowed down, they weren't moving as quickly as we wanted them to, and we were having a lot of miscommunications. At some point, I moved my desk and went and sat in the middle of the development team. This allowed us to have quick feedback and overhear little conversations that were happening that I had additional context I could provide and additional assistance I could give that made these conversations go so much more quickly and we built better things. A few months later, we ended up moving buildings um, and we were all in the same space. We made sure of that but we ended up splitting our product and development teams where product managers were on kind of one side of an aisle and the development team was on the other side of the aisle. And we noticed just that little bit of additional space slowed down our pace of communication because having to make the trip across an aisle as opposed to just overhearing little things or popping a head up and saying, hey, what do you think about this uh, was an additional burden. So make sure that we are taking the, the time and the effort to proactively go and see what's going on within the development teams that we work with. And developers, don't be afraid to raise your hand when you need to, when you need to have a question or need a quick decision. You may also be saying, we talk all the time. We have biweekly demos and planning meetings. Um, at the end of the day, Demo should never be the first time that a product manager sees a completed story or feature. How often do you get into a demo situation and hear the question, oh, is that really how it's going to work? All of the little details that go into building products and building stories, micro interactions, default states, enabled or disabled buttons, these are all the kinds of things that can be figured out before a demo if you're willing to talk to your product manager during the development process. 
There's nothing I love more than having someone say, hey, look at this thing I just got working or hey, here's something that I'm working on and it's not feeling quite right. Let's talk about it um, or even better. Here's something I'm working on. Here's what you asked for. But I think that I can make it even better if we do something slightly different. This this collaboration and working together will allow us all to make better decisions and better products. The second tip for working with me as a product manager is talk technology with me. Uh, as I mentioned before, we sit at the center of business user experience and technology. So naturally, the more that we can be involved in the tech, the better decisions that we can make and the better collaboration we can have. I am not from a developer background. I came from a marketing and strategy background. So coding is not where I started. But I have had to learn technology over the years and found that the more tech that I learn and the more that I can discuss what the, what the underlying platform is for my product, the better decisions I can make and the, the easier everyone's life is. I want to be your advocate as a product manager. I want to be able to make sure that the other parts of the business see the value that our team is providing. And when it comes to a lot of the things that we are building, we have a split. So we see in technology a mix of feature work and then a portion of things that are maintenance work. Well, when I'm talking to my business counterparts or my sales counterparts, what they see is stuff that I can actually sell and a waste of time and money. And when I'm having conversations in finance uh, reviews or in uh, roadmap planning times, I'm constantly being asked to shrink the amount of maintenance, to shrink the amount of money that we spend going to making sure that our technology platform is up to par. And I know that we all know that those technology upgrades are not just for fun that they are actually things that will help us move faster. They will help us build better products. They will keep our development teams happier because they're working in more modern technology stacks. So I have to have the, I have to be armed with the knowledge of what the, what we're trying to build within those maintenance blocks and what we would like to do and why it's going to make the product better so that I can deflect any conversations from people who might want to do something different or might want to cut those things out. The best way to give me the information I need to be your advocate is to talk about the technology with me and don't just assume that I'm not gonna understand. I also want to avoid dumb decisions that make your life as a developer harder. I was once working on a product uh, that was built all around purchase orders. Um, evaluating purchase orders, back orders, what was going on with them. And as we were building this platform, we had we knew that we needed to have the ability for people to export their purchase orders. There were multiple ways that uh, that it could it could be done. Um, we might need to email the purchase orders or export it into a CSV or create a PDF that can be printed or print straight from the app. As we were looking at the MVP of this product, we thought that the best way, to make it go faster would be to just do create a PDF. So we started looking at creating a PDF for the, for the app, and that's what I wrote in the stories. Um, as I talked to my development team, I found out that built, based on the platform that we were building and the way that things had been architected, there were a lot of ways that we could have exported purchase orders. Um, and in terms of ease of use, CSV would be the simplest thing, printing would be the next simplest thing, and then a lot of different options before trying to tackle putting something into a PDF, um, simply because it just wasn't the fastest way to do it. They could do it, but it would have taken twice as long as some of the other options. By having that conversation up front, we were able to avoid unnecessary headache and actually do the simplest thing for the product. Another common example that I see, uh, particularly when working with my design team and my development teams, is we'll create lovely mock-ups of our designs uh, that typically include some sort of custom checkboxes. And as a product manager, I didn't realize at first that creating custom checkboxes is a huge pain. It breaks everywhere, it's difficult, 
Um, and at the end of the day, that's not the thing that's going to be driving value to my customers. It may look pretty, but it's not the thing that I care about the most. So having those conversations with my developers, if we had just put that into the backlog without discussing it, um, all of a sudden, this story that I thought was probably no big deal would have become a much bigger and taken a lot longer time. But understanding the technology behind it, we're able to make better discussions, or better calls up front and not waste our time on things that aren't actually driving customer value. I also want to understand technology uh, so that I can plan better work for the future. The more that I know how things work, the better I can understand the scale and the scope of some of the things that we're trying to that we're trying to do. I used to manage an app called Tripcase. Uh, it was a mobile mobile travel management app, and I after a while I really understood the architecture and the technology behind everything that we were building. And what this allowed me to do was in conversations I was having with stakeholders, when they would come to me and say, oh, we want to do this little integration with this third party, I knew in general if it was actually going to be easy or if it was going to be something much harder given the architecture and given what the third party's architecture was. Um, or if I had was dreaming of a feature and dreaming of something I wanted to build, I could, I could set my own expectation and know in general, is this going to be huge? Is this going to be fairly simple? Uh, and then work with my development team to figure out exactly what we would build. Um, it also allowed me to avoid embarrassment on my own uh, so that I didn't come to the team saying things like, oh, it's just a little change here. Um, we all know that just a little change is never just a little change. And the more that I understood of the technology, the better I was able to prepare uh, and come in with reasonable asks. So you might be skeptical. You might be thinking, it's going to take way too long to teach my product manager about our technology. Um, in similar vein to doing maintenance and keeping our platform up to date, slowing down up front will, will reap great re rewards in the long run the more that you're able to teach me and help me understand what's going on with the technology, the better your life will be and the faster we will all move as a team going forward. Uh, the other thing that I hear often when we talk about technology and product managers is I don't want my product manager telling me how to do my job, which is understandable. So now I'm speaking to my product managers again. Um, don't tell your developers how to do their job. That's not what we're here for. And I actually see this most often with people who started off in engineering and have moved into product management. When you move into product management, your job is no longer to decide what the architecture of your app is going to be. It's no longer to decide how things are going to be implemented. And I see a lot of times developers that move into product want to move into product because they have this, this sense that if I move into product, I'll get to decide all of it. I can decide what we build and I can make sure it's built the way that I want and I can get in there and do little bits of work. Um, that's not what you're there for anymore. You're there to make different kinds of decisions and to support your team and advocate for your team, not to tell them how to do their job or micromanage the way that they do it on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's be respectful of our teams and uh, work together. The third tip for working with me and getting the most value out of me as a product manager is to challenge me. Often we see product management teams and development teams talk in a meeting and then walk away and not actually say the things that were on their minds. But what's really valuable is healthy friction. The ability for product managers and engineers to discuss a feature, discuss something that we want to build, uh, and have, have internal debates about why are we doing this? What's the value of this? Is this really the most important thing? Because your challenges force me to question my assumptions. I was building at one point a feature for... Um, travel arrangers looking for or for people for following trips where we were um, making it to where if you weren't traveling, you could follow someone else's trip who was. 
I was building this space off of a lot of assumptions of how people behave when they're traveling based on my own experiences and some of the discussions that I had had with customers. We started getting questions about this from our development team as to why we were actually doing this. Is this actually the way that people travel? And is this the thing that we should be doing right now? That questioning allowed me to go back, reevaluate the assumptions that I was making, and make sure that we were doing things in the right order and doing things that were the most valuable for our customers. Your challenges also force me to explain my reasoning. Again, product managers are making decisions all day long. We're constantly thinking through what the next thing is, making quick calls on different things. Um, and people think that there is a lot of thought and a lot of planning that goes into some of those decisions. The actual reality is sometimes we have no idea what we're doing. We're making calls because as I mentioned, it's a service to the team. It's something that we can do to help keep things moving. For example, uh, when we were redesigning our travel app, um, we had past trips. You could take your trip and it was a future trip. And then once it was finished, it was a past trip. And at some point during the development process, someone said, should people be able to edit their past trips? We were making a bunch of different decisions and I quickly just said, why would anyone wanna edit a past trip? Don't worry about it, just say no. Uh, once it's done, they can't edit it. Several years down the line, we were talking about new functionality and different things that were going on. And I heard some team members discussing the concept of editing past trips. And they were discussing why all of the thought and all of the theory that had gone into why we said that people can't edit past trips, because it would cause all of these issues. And it was a big deal. And there was absolute thought put into why we couldn't change that fact. As I overheard this discussion, I kind of stuck my head in and said, hey, um, I, I know why we can't edit past trips. It's because when we were building it, someone asked me if we should be able to edit past trips and I said, no. There was no more thought put into it than that. So people had been assigning a much deeper reasoning and a much deeper decision-making process to something that was really just an off-the-cuff decision. So challenging those assumptions forces me to explain my decisions and at least lets people know if it's something that is set in stone with solid reasoning or if it's something that we just had to make a call and move on. So you may be skeptical of some of this. Uh, what I hear a lot when I talk about challenging your product manager is, why try? They're not going to listen. Uh, and I think that this has been true and probably is still true in a lot of uh, a lot of companies. So product managers, let's talk. You don't have all the answers. Leverage the value of your counterparts. As we sit in the middle of business technology and user experience, we're there to pull people together, not to be the one doing all the deciding or knowing everything that's right. A word of caution. Um, Keep your challenges productive. Don't be a jerk. Um, I have had situations where I've been working with a development team and it kind of gets into a state of stump the product manager where people are trying to one up each other of asking the toughest questions and finding the one thing that the product manager didn't think about and making it a little bit more of an aha kind of a moment rather than a collaborative let me ask you questions and challenge you so that we're building the best thing. This isn't healthy and it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the collaborative uh, culture that we're trying to build between product and engineering. So keep your challenges productive, be kind in the way that you ask your questions um, and make sure that you're, you're keeping everyone's best interest at heart. Also a word of caution, I will challenge you too. This is where the real magic happens and where the real difficulty lies. When you can challenge me and I listen and I can challenge you and you listen, then we can open the door to productive conversation. Again, I was working on an app uh, that we were building out some functionality 
And as we were talking with our development team, um, you know, we talked about wanting this functionality on iPhone, Android, and on the web app. And one of the developers started saying, well, if we do it on all three, it's going to be, we're going to have to do the work three times over. And I started thinking about this and based on what I understood of the architecture and of what we built, I asked the questions and challenged a little bit and said, so from what I understand of how we build, we build out a web app and then we adapt it for iPhone and Android. So I understand that there will be additional work, but it doesn't seem like it's actually rebuilding it three times. Help me understand what's going on here or what's different in this. It turned out they didn't actually need to develop it three times. They just didn't want to build it for all three. There were some legitimate reasons to not build this functionality within the web app. But rather than having that conversation, they just kind of threw out the statement of, we're gonna have to build this three times, hoping to shut the conversation down. Um, but instead we were able to have a real conversation about what the actual concern was and re-architect and re re-decide what the, what the feature was going to be to make it best for everyone. The fourth tip for working with me is to be transparent with me. Uh, I have worked with a lot of teams over the years uh, and particularly within development teams and product teams. Um, there seems to be this, this thing that happens where no one wants to say when something's going wrong. We just want to make everything seem like it's fine even though we all know stuff isn't gonna be happening. And I know a lot of this happens because historically, the business teams have not been incredibly kind when something had a delay on the development side, um, which isn't right. But what it has bred is a world where we have scorecards. So you have things like uh, a scorecard that in week one says everything's green, it's good to go. And what's actually happening is everything's green, it's good to go, it's the first week of a project. Uh, in week two, the scorecard still says it's green, but the team has started to uncover some things that might not be great. Uh, week three, we're still saying that it's green, but the team knows it's bad. Week four, everything's going wrong. Week five, the zombies are out. Everything's on fire. Um, and we go about this and everything still says on the scorecard that it's green. We all know that this isn't what's actually happening. I've worked with people who have actually made the statement, oh, everyone knows that things aren't going well, but we have to put green on the scorecard because if you say that it's yellow, you have to talk to a director. And if you say that it's red, you have to talk to a VP. And my statement is, go talk to the director, go talk to the VP. There are people who could help you with this. There are people who can help unblock things, or if they can't help unblock, they will at least know what's actually going on and not get us an unpleasant surprise down the road. Most of the time when, when people get angry about delays or about things not going the way that they should, they're not actually angry that something went wrong. They're angry because they were essentially lied to. Transparency builds trust. The more that you can build trust between the product and engineering teams or between the product development team as a whole and your external stakeholders, the more productive conversations you can have and the more you can start to have real conversations about what's going on rather than trying to obfuscate and pretend that things are going well when they're not. Talk about the good, talk about the bad, talk about the ugly, talk about all of it. This will make your life so much easier in the long run. And my last tip for working with me as a product manager, give me some grace. I am going to make mistakes. I'm going to make decisions that are wrong. I'm going to have days where I'm not as gracious as I should be when uh, something is being slowed down. Uh, we're going to have disagreements about what the right thing is and have to make different calls based on what we know at the time. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to get to is trust. I know in a lot of organizations, you see things happen when this trust starts to get degraded, where a product manager comes in and gets mad because a product uh, project went over time and over budget. And so then on the next project, the development team adds 
10% or 20% to give a buffer so that the product manager won't yell, but then that makes it harder for the product manager to get funding to build the thing that is now, now looks bigger. Uh, and this cycle continues to go on to nobody's benefit. The more that you can build that trust and have those transparent, open conversations, you don't need to play games like adding in 20% buffer um, or saying things that are, are, are all right when they're not. Building a great product is a team sport. And having a strong product and engineering collaboration can be that winning combination. But we have to be on the same team in order to make it happen. So let's do what we came here to do, which is build products that people love. Thank you very much. And I look forward to talking to you all soon.